So we are now recording. Make sure I hit the wrong button. Okay, so Lightroom for Beginners. We're going to cover four things. Well, more than four things. Four concepts and a lot of information inside those concepts. So basic importing, develop module overview, simple edit steps with brushes and presets, and basic export. So I know it sounds simple, just four things, but believe me, it's going to be a lot of information. We are recording, and you'll be allowed to or, uh, watch it for free again. So um, just sit back and, and just try and, and um, absorb. And if you have any questions, uh, jot those down, and I'll be taking questions at the end. You can go ahead and ask them now in the question box, and I will try and go back through and pick out ones that are applicable to the entire group. Okay. So um, first thing we're going to do is import. All right, and when you open up your Lightroom, it comes and you've got these five modules: library, develop, map. Well, more modules now in Lightroom five, but um, map, book, slideshow, print. We're going to work in library and develop, and we're going to import. So there's an import button down here in the bottom left corner, but you can always come up to um, file and then import photos and videos if you don't see the import button down here. So I'm going to import. And I left my card reader at home, so I'm going to import from my hard drive. And how I can do that is that Laura sent me some pictures uh, that Brooke Logue had offered to us to use, and they're in my downloads. So I downloaded them. They're on my hard drive. See, if you look here on the left side, I'm on the left side, the left panel, we have source. See the source? And we have my Macintosh hard drive, and we've got downloads, and here we've got Laura too. So these are the photos that I'm going to import. They're already on my hard drive, so really I could just add them. I would I don't necessarily have to copy them or move or um, copy the DNG. I could choose to move them. So so now I'm going to take them from where they already are. Okay? And I'm going to get into what the catalog is in just a minute. I just want to show how to import pictures first. So let's get some pictures in there, and then we'll talk more about that. So they're already on my hard drive. They're in my downloads folder. They're on my hard drive. Let me repeat that again. They are on my hard drive. <laughs> I know that sounds like I get it. You're thinking, I get it, Amanda. I get it. But sometimes I need to repeat that because some people have trouble with the import process. They're already in my hard drive. We're not making new copies to be stored in Lightroom. We're just letting Lightroom know they exist. That's it. That's it. Lightroom just knows they exist. Lightroom does not store your pictures. You know, if you if you uninstall Lightroom, your pictures won't go with Lightroom. Okay? Your pictures are on your hard drive. Or they're on your card reader, and you're going to copy them from the card reader to your hard drive. Lightroom is just a conduit. It's just a conduit. It's just going to facilitate the import. So here, they're already in my hard drive, and I can move them. Or I can, if I just choose to add, they're going to stay put in my downloads folder. I can choose to move them say, hey. I want to take them out of this downloads folder. I'm going to put them somewhere new. So now, when we do that, we have some information we need to give to Lightroom on the right-hand side. So this left-hand side is our source. This right-hand side is all about the destination. What's going to happen to those files as we move them or as we, um, if we copy from your um, car, memory card, from your camera, to your hard drive. We would copy them. So the right hand side, this is all information that you need to be doing every time you import. Every time you import, take your time doing this. I'm going to stress things that are really important and you're going to hate me for it, but then you're going to love me later. Take your time. Take your time. I'm going to say this again. Take your time during the import process. Think about what you're doing because it is so easy to mess this part up and then you'll cry later. So take your time. If you, we have some choices, file handling. I'm just going to leave this area alone. All I have checked is don't import suspected duplicates. So if, if Lightroom thinks it already has it, let's leave it alone. I do want standard. I'm sorry. I want standard previews. And then I'm going to close that one up. Now we've got file renaming. I am going to rename these files so that I can find them better. And I have a brook load template set up. So it changes her, her file name. See the file name that she has? And I'll, I've got it to be log, and then the suffix, um, pre, the pre, uh, yeah, the suffix. And so we're going to do that. So it just renames those files for me so that 
they're easier for me to find later. Keywords. Well, these are Brooks pictures, so I'm going to do that. I'm also going to do um, May 4th webinar. I already imported these a few <laughs> earlier today, so I deleted them. That's why it's seeing this tab, these keywords. So now I'm applying these keywords so I can find these needle in a haystack, uh, you know, next year or two years from now or next month, wherever. These keywords will hang with the picture so that I can find them. And we're going to talk about keywords more in just a bit. Now, once you put them in there, you need to hit enter. You need that white box to go gray for those keywords to stick. So now the destination, and the destination really is the most important panel. If you don't do anything else on this right-hand side is you've got to pay attention to the destination, all right? This is where they're going to be copying or moving the, the images from, like here, this downloads folder to somewhere else, or from your card reader to somewhere else. You have to tell Lightroom where to put it. If you don't, Lightroom's going to just do the default and you're going to have a bazillion 2014 folders. Okay. So, um, pick this every time. And what I'm doing here is I'm doing organizing into one folder under my Lightroom webinar sample picks and I have May 4th Lightroom samples. So we can kind of see, do you see the grayed out bar right here where this is grayed out? Lightroom saying, Hey, this is what it's going to look like. This is where it's going to go. If I change this to, say, be low picks, see how it changed it? And now we're looking at this one. Now it's going to look like be low picks. All right, but actually I already have one in there. There we go. So that one. Oops. Turn that one off. I'd already created that folder. There we go. So that's where I want it to go. And, and it, now it's going to move them. It's going to physically take them out of the downloads folder into this other folder. And I'm going to hit import. Okay, so if you're taking notes, you need to have importing. Lightroom facilitates the addition or moving of files on your hard drive. Lightroom does not have your pictures. Somebody asked me a good question. Um, it's actually a professional photographer, a wedding photographer, and she's really entrenched in Photoshop. She's trying to use Lightroom, and somebody told her that when she imports and she's edited, then she needs to delete all of her pictures because it's going to slow down Lightroom. That, no, that's a myth, okay? You can have 30,000 pictures in your catalog, okay? And that's not going to slow down Lightroom one bit because Lightroom doesn't have your pictures. Your pictures are on your hard drive, so that should be on your notes, too. Pictures are on my hard drive. <laughs> okay. So now we can see our import. And let's quickly talk about the catalog. because, And I, I want to make sure that this is understood. The catalog, um, for some people, like this is a new machine. I don't use it that much. And it's a small, I mean, I do use it, but um, it's got a very small hard drive. So I put most of my pictures on an external hard drive or my desktop, my PC desktop. So the ones that are actually on this in this catalog is only 700 pictures. But I actually have another catalog on my external hard drive that has like 7,000 pictures. And on my PC desktop, I have 18,000 pictures. So don't look at this and think, oh, well, she's not, you know, she doesn't have all of her pictures in Lightroom. I do. I promise. It's just this only has 128 gigabyte flash drive, and so I keep it on an external. These are all the ones you're seeing that's the catalog that's stored on my hard drive. Okay. Um, so the catalog is um, just the pictures that you've let Lightroom know exist. Either they were on your hard drive already. And if you're new to Lightroom, you probably have 5,000 pictures, 10,000 pictures on your hard drive. You can slowly let Lightroom know about those pictures. I've gone back, last year I went back and added in 2010 pictures that I had not, because um, I wasn't using Lightroom back in 2010. So I brought in 2010 pictures. Does that make sense? Um, so I just let Lightroom know they exist. They were already on my hard drive. I just let Lightroom know that they were there, and Lightroom creates these little virtual shortcuts so I can get to it quickly. Okay. So now we have these pictures, and... I'm not going to talk about collections or folders or anything else like that. We're going to get straight into editing because as a, as a new user, a Lightroom beginner, 
You just need to know how to get the pictures there to start with and then how to start editing it because I know you're ready to edit. So we're going to go to the develop module. I'm going to click over up here at the top to develop. And I want to take a good tour of the develop module because this is where the majority of your time is spent is editing here. Okay. So um, this left hand side has our navigator. Let me go through the all right, so we have these different panels, Navigator, Presets, Snapshots, History, and Collections. The Navigator um, does some different things for you. It allows you to preview changes before you make them, and I'll illustrate that in a bit. And then you can also change your what you're seeing. So I can choose to see a one-to-one, -one, okay? If I want even closer in, I can do one-to-three. Oops, come on now. And... I want bigger than there we go. I was thinking three to one. So you can even get get in bigger or smaller. All right, so you can see that. If you click right here, that's what I was thinking. I'm tired and I didn't do my ratio right. So that would be one to three. This would be three to one. Really big, really close. And then we can go back to like one third. Presets are recordings of steps that other people have made and provided for you to make editing faster or allow you to edit in a way that you're not ready to because you're still learning Lightroom. You know, you don't know how to do certain things. Presets would allow you to do that. I use presets all the time because they make my editing faster. I just did a family shoot, made some, I made a big mistake I'll talk about later, and ended up having to do some pretty heavy editing because of that. And not heavy, heavy, but uh, corrected things. So I use presets to help me make that quicker, 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 instead of going through and doing everything by hand. So that's presets. And we're going to show you how to use those. Snapshots are like captures in time. And we're going to show you how to do that too. And one of the nicest things about Lightroom is that it records your history. And if you close Lightroom and come back to a month in a month to this picture, I'll be able to see all the steps I took. It doesn't erase the history ever. It's always there unless you choose to erase the history. So it's always there. And then we've got collections, which are collections I've made in the library module. So I can quickly go to some other collection and then bounce back to the one I'm at if I've made this a collection. So I won't do that because I haven't made this a collection, this set. All right. Um, so that's the left hand side and we're going to go through those individually. This right hand side is where all the editing takes place if you're doing it by hand. And we have our histogram, which is the same histogram you saw in your camera's LCD screen on the back of your camera. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit more. Then if you move out of it, you see your EXIF data. So this was shot at ISO 200 with the 50 millimeter at aperture 1.4 with a shutter speed of 1 um, 1,250th of a second. Okay. What's down below it? These are our local adjustments. These are th changes that are made to small areas of the image, to, to particular spots. And I think that's important. So if you're taking notes, you want to, you know, say um, icons below histogram equals um, local adjustments, local small areas of the image. Okay. When I say global, that means the entire image. When I say local, that means small individual changes to particular areas. Okay. Now, then we have these different panels. Basic, tone, curve, hue, saturation, luminance, split toning, detail, lens correction, effects, and camera calibration. And I don't want to get into two. I'm not going to get into all of them. I'm going to quickly cover those that you really um, will use the most. But all of these, all of these are global edits. These are going to be applied to the entire image. It's not going to discriminate between, you know, the face area and background. It's not going, you cannot, and you can't mask off. So if you're a Photoshop or a Photoshop Elements user, if you do things here, it's not like you can add a mask and cover it up. It's global. It is there. And I'll show you a way that you can balance global and local adjustments to get what you need. So, um, oh, and down here at the bottom, we have our film strip. So these are all the pictures 
that I just brought in and, and um, came in. If I was in a particular collection, it would show me all the pictures in that collection. If I had sorted by keyword tags, it would um, just put that. So let me let me do that very quickly. So you can see, because this is where a lot of people get confused with um, pictures being in Lightroom. So if, um, let's do something like, okay, so basis of history, here we go. All right. So now if I come over to develop module, these are all the pictures from um, an event I did, okay? Uh, well, my daughter's event, a uh, face of a uh, homeschooling night. Anyway, so you can see that that's the only thing in my film strip are those uh, pictures with that tag, the pictures with that tag. Or I can change to a collection, say, like Lopa Farm. So these are pictures that I have in the collection Lopa Farm. I'm going to go back and get to my previous import. There we go. Because some people will say, well, I can't stand that my film strip has all 8,000 of my pictures or it has all, you know, 3,000 of my pictures, whatever. It just drives me crazy because I've heard this. It doesn't need to have that in there. If you sort by keywords, if you make collections, this can be a nice, tidy little area that's very manageable for you. So um, just know that about the film strip. If you're working with a small monitor like I am, this is a 13 inch, then what you can do is click these little triangles and see it collapses it down. And then the triangle turns to these little dots. See, there's little dots down here. What that means is there's something there, but it's hidden. And all I have to do is mouse over. Whoops, not too far down. There we go. As soon as my mouse goes over it, it'll pop back up. And as soon as I move away, it'll drop back down. I can do the same for the sides. So this, see this triangle? See, it's gone away, and I will get emails like, my develop panel is just gone. It's just gone. It's just not there. And I'm like, okay, you see, there's a little triangle. You need to click the triangle. So, oops, if I just come over here and mouse over, that that panel slides back out, and if I move away, it, it collapses back in. And that's what I'll use during our time tonight because I'm, I'm working with a very small space. Uh, another thing to know, if I click it here, you can make your panels bigger or smaller. So if I decide I want to be able to, you know, read all the text, or if I really don't need much of the text, I can squish it down. So you can expand um, the side panels a bit. And I'm just going to collapse that one down. Okay. Remember, if you have any questions, go ahead and um, either write them down or go ahead and type them in the uh, question box because I will go back at the end and look over them and uh, repeat the question and then provide the answer. Okay, so let's go through the basic panel quickly here. Uh, something to know that's very handy, if you're familiar with Photoshop or Photoshop Elements, and if you get tired of hearing me say that, I apologize, but the majority of people who do get Lightroom already have previous uh, um, experience with Photoshop and or PSE and I want to make sure that they get these little nuggets of information. So some keyboard shortcuts that work in both um, Photoshop and Photoshop Elements also work in Lightroom such as Control plus to zoom in or Command plus if you're on a Mac. So Command plus to zoom in or Command Control minus to move out. Okay so Control minus on a PC Control plus on a Mac, and you can zoom in and out. Just like in Photoshop, if I want to move to another area, and it's fine here, I've got my hand, but sometimes when I'm editing with a brush or something like that, so let's do it like that. If I want to be able to move around, I can hit my space bar, and now I can move it. So I'm holding down my space bar and clicking my mouse, and I can move around. And this helps if you're really zoomed in into a particular area, like I've worked on one eye and I need to work on another. And that same thing works in Photoshop and Photoshop Elements also. And I'll try and talk about more um, of the same things, uh, things that are similar later. So I'm going to do Command minus. Okay, so let me close this up. In our basic panel, which if you've ever shot RAW and you're a Photoshop, Photoshop Elements user, you're going to notice that it looks just like the ACR panel. It is. It's just like the ACR panel for CS, um, 
6 and PSE 12. Okay, so the ACR looks just like this. And if you're familiar with that, hey, you've got a jump start on editing in Lightroom because it's the same thing. So what we're going to do is just go quickly go through. We have our white balance, which is our temperature and tint. And just like you can use the eyedropper in Photoshop, PSC, you can do that here. So I can go somewhere in here that would be neutral and click on it. And a lot of times that is the whites of the eyes, okay? I know you think, well, the whites of the eyes um, should be white, but really they're like a gray. So I can click there. So that was that was one click, and it instantly warmed this picture up, didn't it? Instantly warmed it up. And I can show you with one click what that did. So this is a little cool, and this is um, warmer. So I was happy with that. You can keep clicking around. You can keep clicking. Okay, so you can keep clicking. If you notice that your dropper jumps back over here, what you need to do is uncheck auto dismiss down here. This is your toolbar for the different adjustments. If you're not seeing this, you need to go up to view and click toolbar. So right now I could hide it. See, I'm not seeing it. This is what happens. This is another email we get a lot. I'm not seeing what you have on when you do the webinars. So down here it's missing. My toolbar is missing. If I go up to view, show toolbar, there it is. Okay. Exposure, I can brighten or darken here. If I want to brighten, I can pull it to the right. If I want to darken, I can pull it to the left. And, you know, I think it was pretty good as is. So I'll pull it back a little bit. Actually, I might like it. There we go. Back to zero. And contrast, we can add some contrast there if we want to, just a little bit. Highlights are those, if you had clipping, if we, if there was, uh, if something was overexposed, if we have those blinkies in your camera, that means you've overexposed something. And let me go to one right here. Here we go. So see all the red? This is where it's been, um, it's so bright, it has just clipped the information. It's, it's blown it out. There's no data left. It's gone. Well, right there. We can recover some of that, though. And if you're not seeing the red, but you see that your histogram is climbing this right side, then you know you've got clipping. You've got an area that's overexposed. If you want to see that area, you click the triangle up there in the top right corner. Click that triangle. And we can pull the highlight. So that's that brightest area. So now we've pulled it down a good bit. And we can start to see some of her hair in that area now. We can also pull down the exposure a little bit. Just like that. So see how much more we see of her hair, whereas before it was just so bright we couldn't see any of it. That is clipping. Um, the highlights. Okay. Shadows. If, if we have an area that's um, real dark, it's that those um, darker mid-tone areas, that, that is your shadows. And um, there's a time to use them and a time not to use it. So we won't get into that. Why to those midtones if you feel like you need to brighten that up? But see, when I did that, I got clipping here, didn't I? See that? So be careful about how you use that. And, and then blacks. Those are those darkest areas of the image. At Photoshop World, I learned a new little trick. Okay? New little trick. And I don't know why I didn't, this didn't dawn on me before, because you can use this with other stuff, too. If you hold down your Alt or Option key and click your black slider, as you move to the left, you we already have some clipping here, uh, shadow clipping, but that's okay. I'm going to keep moving this. I want to start seeing some other parts of the image, and there we go. I found some there. And so what that did is it pulled us down to negative 24, and it pulled over our histogram some, but it, it brought in a little more definition for us, didn't it? A little more contrast. So it's not as hazy. And if I want to brighten up the image a little bit, I can still do that by pulling the exposure up a little bit. Clarity is an edge definer. And it's going to look for those edges between um, dark and light. And it's going to um, accentuate it. It's almost like a sharpening. It does something It's similar to Unsharp Mask. Now, I'm going to zoom in. Okay. I'm zoomed in. And... I want you to watch as I pull this clarity over. 
So this is up at um, plus 49. And see how it accentuated more of the under eye circles? And if somebody had acne or wrinkles, it would really define those things. So you need to be careful about doing this with, a, with girls or women. Um, you don't want to do that so much. Men and still live, flowers, things like that, sure. Boys, it's fine. But with girls, you want the picture, their skin to be softer. You don't want to be accentuating blemishes or wrinkles. I mean, I know I've got plenty of wrinkles on my own. I don't need anybody to make them worse. So with that, just be careful of, of the clarity. And vibrance. Vibrance is like a very smart saturation. I really don't even know why they still have saturation there. But vibrance brightens and accentuates colors without making the skin tone crazy. So let's back up here a good bit. And we'll pull the vibrance over to like, let's do like point uh, plus 32. You see her skin tone is still pretty good, right? Now, if I did this with saturation, look how she kind of started turning yellowish orange a little bit. Not too bad, and this is rare though, because usually the person turns, their skin looks orange and yellow, it just doesn't do well. So try not to use saturation so much and go instead for vibrance. And it's just gonna make those colors um, a little more saturated, a little brighter, a little more vibrant, to be honest, you know. Okay, so that was the basic panel. And I'm not gonna get too much um, more into stuff because I don't wanna overwhelm new users because we still have the local adjustments to kind of go through. But I wanna quickly show before and after, okay? So here's before and here's after. If you're wondering how did I get the before and after, see this area down here where we're talking about that toolbar? This is the toolbar. It's going to change depending on what you're doing. It's going to look different. So here, when you see YY, so what I selected, it's showing me a vertical before and after. If I want just the after, I click on this rectangle inside a rectangle. That's called the loop view. Loop means one. It's going to do one. If you see grid view, that's going to be multiple pictures at once. That's for the library. You can't see a grid view in the develop. You can see a before and after or a single, but that's it. So now we have different choices, too. We can do um, top, bottom. So if you've done a landscape, this might work better for you than the vertical side by side. We can even do a split. So we can split it to see oops, the changes. Come on. There we go. Wanted to move it over a little bit, but it's acting ornery. So we can see warmer and cooler. Let's zoom in a little bit. There we go. So you never tell that the right side is warmer, the left side is cooler. I'll go back to before and after. There we go. Okay, so really quickly, I'm going to go through some um, local adjustments. Again, very quickly, because then I want to show how to do some, some of the same changes with presets, and then we're going to talk about exporting, getting these pictures out. That's where a lot of people have a challenge also, is they, they'll edit, 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 and they'll, I mean, they'll email me and say, hey, I've got like 300 pictures to edit it. How do I get them out of Lightroom? How do I get these things out? So we're going to go through that process too. Okay, so let's quickly, the crop, how to use the crop tool. The crop is so smart in Lightroom, it's so smart in Lightroom because you can always go back to it. So I can crop now, I can crop to whatever area and then maybe a month from now I come in and say, no, I really, I want the full picture again. Well, it's still there. So here I'm a crop, okay, so we got this crop, come on. Here I crop. Now let's say I want to change it. There it is. It's still there for me. It hasn't done away with any of the information, any of the other canvas. Your your image is really is called a canvas. So it hasn't cut away any of the canvas. Um, what if I want to crop to a particular size? So right now it's doing as shot and I've got a lock beside it, right? Well, I'm gonna unlock it. See that? I'm gonna unlock it. So what if I say I want something really unusual? I want a 
skinny, skinny picture like this. That's what I want. I was able to do that because I unlocked it. Okay. Now, if you print this, you know when it prints, it's going to be all white around it. You have to trim it, which is fine if that's what you want. If we want a standard size like an 8 by 10, well, now it gives me that. And I can just pull out one side or the other. Probably a little bit more there. Whoops. So now we have an 8 by 10. Oh, I can change it again. All right. And the keyboard shortcut for crop is R. So you can hit R on your keyboard. And I do recommend, like, make, start making a list of shortcuts because the more you can just quickly tap something on your keyboard to do a particular thing, it saves you so much time. It, it really adds up. So R in the keyboard. And I might say I want to change that to something else. What if I want to do something completely different? What if I want like a 5x5? Five five? Well, I could do 5x5. Five five. There we go. So you can make it. I mean, there, it's endless to the crop tool. I love it. It's so fantastic. And one more thing. One more thing about the crop tool. If I was doing something like 5x7. Five Okay, there we go. Let's do five by seven like that. That's how it would normally come up. What if you say, well, I, I really don't want this to be portrait orientation anymore. Portrait orientation means up and down, vertical. So what if I want a landscape orientation, which is horizontal? Hit X on your keyboard and it will flip that around. There's no other way to accomplish that. You can't, you can't click in and drag around. It's just not going to let you do it, okay? You're going to have to hit X on your keyboard to do that. And you see as I'm moving stuff, so you can do a particular crop, and you can make it slant, or if it's crooked, you can straighten it. Um, all kinds of stuff that you can do. I wouldn't recommend, you know, I mean, this is beautiful too. So just be careful if you have a, a, a long distance shot and you, and you crop in too, too much. What's going to happen when you print that, it's going to be very pixelated. So just be careful. This is probably not too much. But um, if you have a, a if you're really far away from your subject and you crop in that close, it's probably not going to print great. It may look fine on the internet, but not print well. So just word of caution there. Okay, so now we can also straighten, and I'm just going to go back to as shot. So there we go. If I want to straighten because I see a particular line, I want the whole image to line up with. You can click on the straighten tool and then you just click and drag so I see the line of that building and then it'll straighten it for me. And then I'm going to do done. So that is the crop tool. Another local adjustment that you want to know how to use is the um, clone and heal tool. Okay. So with this one, it's not as smart as Photoshop and Photoshop Elements. I'm just going to say it. It still needs a lot of work. It just really does. And this is my brush. See the brush? And it's taking forever to get smaller. Here we go. And you can make the brush bigger or smaller. If you have a mouse that has a scroll wheel in the middle, you can pull back to make it smaller and push out, push forward to make it bigger. That's what I'm doing right now. You can also, on your keyboard, the right and left bracket keys. So right bracket key will make it bigger. Left bracket key will make it smaller. But I'll tell you, it's really handy with the mouse. That's one thing I miss about, I wish I could do that with brushes in Photoshop, make it bigger and smaller with my mouse, but you can't. Okay, so I can use heel, heel here or clone, but I'm going to go with heel. And feather means how much it's going to blend into the pixels around it. And, and usually when you're doing this kind of thing, you do want a high feather. You want it to really blend in. So you don't have a defined start or stop. Okay. And the inner circle is the blemish area. And towards the outer circle, as she goes out, that's what's going to blend in. So I'm going to click right here. And then this circle pops up. And right here, it worked perfectly. But you'll be surprised. Sometimes, like, I'll do something, and then I'll go like that. Okay. <laughs> and you see how it's um, putting a nostril there. 
So um, don't be alarmed if it does that because all you have to do is click and drag to where you want it to go. Okay, click and drag. And it looks fantastic, doesn't it? So what if we're doing another thing? Like I have um, started doing a little bit with the under eye circles with the heel tool also and or the clone tool. It's not going to work as great for her because she's got freckles. But I'll see if I can get it to work. So what I'll do is like kind of grab right here. Oops, too much. Hit delete. Right. Grab right there. All right, so it's coming down to her freckle area, and I don't know that's going to work. So I'm going to move it down to like right here. Okay, and it's it's pretty good, but it's too much. So what I need to do is lower the opacity. The opacity is how see through it like gives it some transparency so that the full effect isn't applied. I don't want 100% of this to go right here. I just want some of it, just some of it so it will kind of heal, um, mask some of her under eye shadows there, her under eye circles. And we can turn it off. So there's before and there's after. And it's hard to see because it's in your way there, but we'll do done. But when I'm doing those under eye circles, that's when it often will like go to the eye or whatever. And I have to move it. So you just have to pull it to where you want it to go. And the clone works just the same way. And try both. So if the heel doesn't work, try the clone. If the clone doesn't work, try the heel. And do that. Um, red eye. So red eye is not hard. You just make your thing smaller. And um, You just click it in there, okay? So, but we don't have a red eye in there, really. Okay, see, then able to find it. That blue is shadow clipping, I meaning it's dark. See, there we go. But it's just that easy to use the um, red eye. Next one is the gradient tool. And um, these are fun. Uh, so just enjoy. <laughs> If you get any custom brushes, you'll know that they show up here. And we're going to talk about custom brushes, and we're going to use them. But let's say I want to brighten a particular side. I can uh, do that, and we're going to talk more about that. So you can change the settings. You can brighten or darken. And then you just have this little crosshair, this little plus sign, and you click and drag out. And see how it brightens that one side? I can do real bright. I can darken that side. Okay. If you have one side, like they're kind of in shade a little bit, so one side's kind of warm, one side's kind of cool, you can change that. And so the gradu graduated filters are fun. And why they're called graduated filters? Because the effect is the strongest on the outside and gradually lessens as it goes in. Okay? And then if you don't like it, you can always hit delete and start over or not, or not use them at all. So I'm just going to hit delete. and um, I'm going to skip the radial filters. Well, if you're new to Lightroom, you probably have Lightroom um, 5, so I'll do that. Radial filter works like the graduated filter, but it is a circle or an oval. Oval. So here I'm going to click and drag out. Okay. So I'm going to do something really extreme. So do you see what's happened? Is It's mostly brightened the outside and not the inside. But watch what happens if I come down here to invert mask. So now it's bright, brightening the inside and not the outside. And I really like using the radial filter for brightening the center of images. But again, this is only in Lightroom 5. Okay, this is not in Lightroom 4, 3, Lightroom 5. Now that was too much, so we'll do something like, maybe like that. Okay, so something small. And you can always change it. I can change the size, so I can do long and narrow, move it around. Or I can do circle be careful you know so you can have it fit your subject all righty so we are we've got 20 minutes left and I'm going to talk about um, doing the edits that we did just now but with presets and then use those brushes okay so I'm going to reset my image the bottom right hand side is reset. Bottom right corner says reset. So I just reset it. Reset it. I didn't reset it. I reset it. So um, a lot of times when people are first getting started, 
you can work on clean edits, meaning make the picture as good as it can look, but still like it came out of camera that way, okay? And then you can do creative edits. So we're going to do both a clean and a creative, and I'm going to show you how to do that. We're going to do both, and I'm going to keep them separate by doing virtual copies. I can also make a snapshot, but we'll talk about virtual copies first. So I'm going to right-click on the bottom and do virtual copy. Okay, so now I've got two of the same picture, see? I've got the original, and then I've got the virtual copy, and you can see the virtual copy, or you know it's the virtual copy because there's a, the corner turned up, and it's, that one is telling you, hey, we're the copy. I'm going to come back to the original. And I'm going to be using presets from the workflow clean edit, and, um, and then I'm going to go and use the clean and creative and then fine art film. So we're going to do a few different things. So I told you there are all these different steps, and we got tone curve, HSL, split toning, detail. I just don't have time to go into all of them tonight and go into exporting and presets. So that will be covered another time. Um, but these are layerable steps to um, simulate what you would do over here. So here I could do like um, soften babies and girls. So it gives a soft one. If I don't want that, if it's too soft, I can do clarity uh, for males and still life. Just depends on, on your subject. Um, there is an all in one clean edit, which we'll come back to. And if I want to do like a little bit of contrast, there we go. You can do contrast a lot. If we need to brighten a little bit, okay. If you don't like a particular step, if with any preset, you can back up by doing Command Z, okay? Command Z. So they're backed up to where I just have contrast a little. Now notice right here in your in your navigator panel here, if you can see it. I wonder if I can make it bigger. Uh, not so much. Um, watch what happens if I do if I hover over. Come on. Normally, if you hover over a preset, it's going to show you what it does. And it's not it's not working for me right now. Come on. Yep, it's not working for me. I don't know why it's not. Let's see if it do it. Usually it previews what it's gonna be, and then you have to click the preset to make it happen. Okay. Alright. So I'm gonna back up, back up. I do want brighten a little. Contrast a little. Okay. And then we can darken, darken. If we have any clipping, we can recover that. But I'm not worried about that little bit of clipping. If there's no high noise or low noise, but she shot at ISO 200. It was well exposed. There's probably no noise or very little, so I'm going to leave it alone. I'm going to sharpen. Okay, for portraits. If I want a little vignette, I can add that there. I do want to warm the image a little bit because, you know, it's a little cool. So I'm going to warm it up just a little bit. So... Very quickly, I was able to produce the same result as I did earlier in the basic panel. So on the left side is before, on the right side is after, and that's with the um, workflow presets. Now, up here, if we are working with the creative, um, clean and creative presets, we can also add in some other things, um, some creative. Like, oops, I want to do that with this one here. So now I'm on my virtual copy. I'm on a different picture. And I can do, let's do just a quick clean and a little bit of contrast and sharpen. And now I can do, now you're seeing the preview. See this preview? As I go over it, you can see what it's going to look like. So I can do like vintage plum. Blueberries, green apples, strawberry, you can see that. So there's different things you can add to it, and it's going to layer them on there. So we got hazy mat, or just make mat. There's different ones, and you pick one from each number group. So you can layer them on. So these are layerable presets. One of the biggest questions we often get is, you can you layer presets? So this set is layerable, the Clean and Creative Advanced Workflow. This set is layerable. The 
other set, um, other, the other sets, um, you, you cannot. And let me explain why, because this is a big question we have. So I reset the picture, and I'm going to go to Fine Art Film. Okay. The reason they're not layerable, remember I told you these are global settings over here? They apply to the whole thing. Normally, creative presets, what they do is they um, change settings to create a particular look, okay? They change settings to create a particular look. These sliders can only be in one place at one time, okay? So this curve can only be one curve at a time, period. This split toning can only be what it is once. It cannot, it's not like Photoshop or Photoshop Elements where you can run one action and then run another and then run another. No. You're in competition for these sliders. And when you play one preset and then go play another, you'll see the sliders change. Okay? So that's why most creative presets, it's, it's one or not. It's, like, it's one at a time. You cannot have both. Except for the clean out workflow, the clean, clean and creative advanced, and then the black and white workflow, which is a creative one also to create your own black and white look. So let's do some fine art film ones here. And see how the navigator is changing as I scroll down? Now, the thing to know about these is that they are not one size fits all. You might find a look you love, but you need to brighten it a little bit. So I might find that I like this look, but it's a little dark. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here to exposure and just brighten it up a little bit. See that? So you have got to tailor the presets for your pictures because when the preset developers created these, it, they can't, they don't know the different um, lighting and, and white balances that people are going to have. So you're going to have to tailor it. You're going to tweak it a little bit, um, brighten it or darken it, that kind of thing. Reduce the clarity, increase the clarity, you know, decrease the contrast, increase the contrast, just because something inherent in your image may um, not fit the preset. So you're just going to tailor it a little bit. So we have two pictures. We've got a clean edit, and then we have a creative edit. And we can export both. But let's before we do that, let's talk, let's try and get in here and do some fine details. And this is one of the local adjustments we have not talked about so far, and that is the brush. So the brush is a way that you can brighten a specific area. You know, in that basic panel, when we did exposure, it increased the exposure over the entire picture, right? If if we had gone down and talked about HSL, if we had increased the reds, it would increase the reds all over the picture. Wherever there was red, it would have done it, or decreased it, or desaturated, or lightened it, whatever. It doesn't say, it doesn't understand that you may not want it on the face, or you may not want it in the background. The local adjustments give you the opportunity to make those small, specific changes, okay? And so that's what I'm going to do here, and I'm going to use the custom brushes, the perfect portrait brushes. And I'm going to use, first, I'm going to um, eye whiten. I'm going to whiten the whites of her eyes. Okay. And when you're working with the brushes, you have feather and flow. Okay. Feather is that blend so that it the changes blend into the pixels around you. Normally, for most things, you want the feather to be high, but when you're working with in a small area like the eye, we don't want we don't want the whitening to blend into the her iris and pupil. So we're going to reduce the feather down so it's a little more defined, just a little more defined. The flow, um, if we reduce the flow, then whatever settings were recorded will be minimized a little bit. It's not going to allow the full effect to be applied. Now it's cumulative, so if you keep brushing and brushing and clicking and brushing, it will add up to 100%. But if you know that a brush effect is kind of strong and you only need a little eye whitening or a little teeth whitening or a little smoothing, you can reduce the flow so that not the full effect won't be applied. Does that make sense? So here I just need to do a little whitening. I don't need to do a whole lot, so I don't want the whole effect to be applied. Because Honestly, the smallest changes are the best. We want gradual changes. If you want to see, if you're seeing red 
or green or whatever you have it set as, that's because you're seeing a mask. And a mask in Lightroom means it's just showing you, well, there are two different kinds of mask in Lightroom. It's showing you where you brushed, okay? And if you turn the mask off, then you can see what the effect is. Now, for here, if we say, okay, we need a little brighter, maybe, I can increase the exposure just a little bit. Just a little bit. That might be too much. We'll back off a little bit. All right, just a tad. So while you have a brush active, you know it's active because there's a, a circle with a black circle on the inside. So you got white on the outside, black on the inside. That act, that pin is active. Watch what happens if I see that. I increase the exposure. I increase the exposure all the way to the right. So you can definitely see where we brushed. But here, if we lower it down, we can see just a small change there. What if you hit an area you didn't mean to? So it's not causing a big problem, but let's say I accidentally brushed into right here. We can erase. See the word erase right here? We can erase. And once we erase, we just click and brush. Once we've clicked erase, we can just brush with our mouse where we don't want it to hit. Okay? There we go. And if that's the only change you want to make, you can click Done. But if we have more brushes, so if, if this one was still active and I want to now maybe sharpen her eyes or brighten her eyes up or something like that, I'm going to click New. Okay, I'm going to click New. So now I'm going to do the um, eyes blue. And again, if you want to see what's happening, you can turn off the mask. So you can see it. And oops, I did fix cast blue, not eyes blue. Whoop, careful. There we go. All right, so much better. <laughs> so much better. So this just makes the eyes a little bluer. If it darkens it too much for you, you can always increase the exposure just a little bit. If you want a little more sharpness, you can add a little more sharpening in there. Just depends on what you want. I'm going to click new and let's do like catch lights. Now, oops, I'm going to brush right here, brush right there, and um, I think that's going to be it for, let's see, and then back away and look at it. If it does, if it looks so amazing, it doesn't look real, then you need to go back and reduce the effects, because if you've made their eyes unbelievably out of this world, amazingly beautiful, then people are going to look at it and say, uh, that's been photoshopped even if you didn't do it in Photoshop, <coughs> if you did it in Lightroom, excuse me, you want it to be so that people look at your pictures and think, wow, she's an amazing photographer. You know, look how good she is. Not, man, like she was heavy on the Photoshop. So be careful with that. All right. Um, so there's a lot of different brushes in the um, Perfect Portrait brush set. And I'll tell you, I use them so much. With the shoot I did recently where I made mistakes, I shot JPEG. And what happened was um, I they were wearing white shirts, and I clipped the shirts. And I did not realize I had shot JPEG. Oh, here's the reason to shoot raw. And I could not really recover that really well. It was just awful. And also made the, the mom, who is of Indian descent, it made her... Uh, more orange and contrasty, so I had to work really hard to kind of desaturate her a little bit, blend in her skin tones a little bit more. So if you can, shoot raw, please, because <laughs> you can recover from that so much. You know, it doesn't create problems, whereas JPEG can create problems with the saturation, with colors, contrast, and then if you clip things, if you overexpose, I, the pictures were not overexposed, just their shirts were. Um, you can get that back and get that that information back because it saves everything. All right, um, so now let's export these two pictures, okay? And I'm gonna highlight them both. So I just clicked on one, held down my shift key, and clicked on the other one. So I can export from the develop module, or I can export from the library module. It doesn't really matter. So I'm gonna export these two. I'm gonna go to file and then export. Okay, so now you remember how I said in the import time, you have got to pay attention to what you're doing in the destination. 
that take your time every time. Don't assume that, oh, it's, you know, it's the same as I always do. Because believe it or not, you're going to forget that you made some special change for that last import and you forgot about it because maybe it's, you know, you've had a lot going on. I'm speaking from experience. So check that import destination every time. Same with the export. Check it every time. And you have got to tell Lightroom. Just like when you import, you got to tell Lightroom where you want those pictures to go. Well, here you've got to tell Lightroom where you want these pictures to be exported to. Lightroom, which I didn't say this at the beginning, is non-destructive editing. None of the changes you make. So I'm going to hit cancel for a minute. If, if I stop right now and I'm not done editing, let's say I'm going to close it up and come back to it tomorrow. There's no save. If you notice, there's no save in Lightroom. There's no file save. There's nothing. There's no save. So as soon as you get out, Lightroom stores all the changes you made in the catalog. Okay, they're stored in the catalog, not on your picture. Stored in the catalog. So in order to get those those changes applied to the picture, we have to export. That's when those changes will be applied. So now file, export. Where do we want to export to? Well, do we want a specific folder? Do we want the same folder as the original? That's what I'm going to go for. I'm going to go for the same folder as original. But now I'm going to choose to put it in a subfolder. So now maybe say edits. You know, whatever. So for the family shoot I just did, I created a new folder at Dropbox, and I um, exported, and I put prints, and then I exported to another folder for web, so she could share on the web. So you can name it whatever you want it to do. You could create a whole new folder, like choose, I mean, a specific folder, and this one give you a chance to create a new folder. See, we can choose, and we can create new folder down here, new folder. So let's say I just want to go to my desktop, I'll create a new folder, and I'll do LR sample edits. Create. Choose. So now they're going to go straight into users, Amanda Padgett, desktop, Lightroom pad, um, sample edits. Sky's the limit. You find a system that works well for you and stick to it. Okay, that's my advice. Play around with a few different systems first, but find what works for you and then stick with it. Renaming file. So I had made some screen prints. So if we want to rename, we can do that now. And it's not hard to rename, I promise. So I'm just going to choose edit and get this out here. So I'm going to put the file name. And then maybe I want to put edit. So here I have my file name. And then you can type in whatever you want. Or you can make all new ones. LR webinar samples, whatever, you know, and then I can add in a sequence number. So it'll be LR samples 1, LR samples 2. If I did 15 pictures, I'd have 1 through 15. So you see how the sky is the limit here? Just click in that box and hit your backspace and start playing around. It's just that simple. And if you find a naming system you like, you can save it as a new preset. So you can see I've got some, well, this is my import one, my renaming. But um, usually I have uh, like Facebook edits. Uh, let's see what else I have for print. This is a different computer. I don't use this one for editing that much. So anyway, so I'm going to hit done. Now, file settings. Normally you're going to want to export to a JPEG. Color space sRGB. Please, please, please make sure. That's important. You don't want pro photo RGB. Lightroom. Their color system is Profoto, but when you export, you want to change, you want it to convert to sRGB because that is what those print labs are going to require. And also for the internet, it needs to be sRGB. Okay, that's important. Make sure your quality is at 100. Do we want to resize? Well, if we're doing for print, no. Okay, and I'm going to change this to 300. I want a resolution of 300. If this is for the internet, if I'm right for my blog or whatever, or for Facebook, I would do about a thousand um, or twelve hundred. I mean, I'm not going to talk about Facebook standards right now because I think the standard is twenty four hundred or whatever. I stick to around fifteen hundred. This is what I have to say about Facebook: the larger, the better. The larger the file, the better it looks within their standard. Does that make sense? Within their guidelines. So if you go 
bigger than they allow, they're going to crunch it. But if you go really small, those pictures don't seem to look as good. So I go usually around 1,500 wide or 1,500 tall, and I'm happy with what that looks like. Why not the full standard? I don't know. I just don't feel like having that big a picture out there. And because the bigger the picture, bigger the size, the bigger the file. Okay, and if you're doing for the web, then you only need 72. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. We do have blog posts specifically on this, okay? So, um, but if I'm doing for print, I'm just going to do 300 and sharpen four, I'm going to do matte paper. And you can change the standard to low, high, or standard. Here's what I'd say about sharpening. <laughs> All right, you can sharpen, like we applied some sharpening with the presets. You can sharpen in the develop module, and then you can sharpen here. It's, it's all good. And then if you're sharpening for print, you want a little extra sharpening. You want it to almost be too sharp because then it looks good for print. But if you're exporting for web and it's too sharp, it's going to look too sharp. It's going to look a little crunchy, a little edgy. It's, mm, it's not going to look right. There's some pictures on some home sites that are just too sharp. And when pictures are really, really, really shiny, it's because they're too sharp. So like they've ever done the sharpening. Um, so for matte paper, I do standard um, or high. And then for screen, if I'm if doing for that, sometimes I actually go for low because, again, I don't like pictures to look too sharp on the Internet. It didn't look right. All right, so I'm just going to do matte paper. Okay, and if you're doing for the internet, you can do add a watermark. You can make it whatever you want. You can make some standards here, sample things. I'm not going to do that here. And I want to see them after um, showing the finder. So now I'm going to export. We can see the status right here, export two files. And it's usually very fast. There we go. Okay, so we can see our two pictures. There is the one we did very quickly, and then there is the clean edit. Here, and I didn't say this, I, I really feel like the beginner class needs to be two hours long. Um, Y'all start asking for that. <laughs> um, with, the, with, with these, the best thing to do is do a clean edit with the brushes first. Because those global presets that are uh, creative, they won't overwrite the brushes. So we could have done her eyes and her skin, and brighten up her face, and done all that, and then done the fine art film preset. Okay, so edit with brushes as much as you can if you know you're going to use creative presets. And those brushes are so helpful. The perfect portrait brush set. Okay, and because I know people are often, we get the same questions often, and um, what did I use tonight? I use Clean and Creative Advanced Workflow, and I use the Fine Art Film, and I use the Workflow Clean Edit Presets. And we get some questions of what's the difference between the Workflow Clean Edit Presets and what's the difference between the and the Clean the Clean and Creative. The Clean and Creative has some cleaning presets in it, and then a lot of creative options, whereas the Workflow has all clean edits things. It's, there's no creative in it at all. Okay. It's all, it's all, um, clean edit. And then the clean creative has a little bit of clean edit and then creative. Okay. So now time for questions. And those, those who don't know, we're doing an intermediate at seven o'clock. So if you can, um, attend that one as well, because, I will be expounding on information that was provided in the past hour here. Okay, so time for questions. All right. Um, let's see. How do you download directly from the camera? Great question, Cindy. Okay, unfortunately, I left my. I used to have multiple card readers. I had a card reader in like all my different laptop bags and on my desk and da da da. Now I actually couldn't find any of them and had to break open a new one I had on hand. And I left that one at home. So I would normally plug it in, okay? And I would, you're because I have it set to import with Lightroom always. Lightroom will open up. If I go to Import Photos, 
my camera will be a source. So right here with a source, we'll have Nikon, whatever, D700. It'll have it as a source. And when you're copying from your camera, if you're not doing a card reader, you can just hook a USB cord up from your computer to your camera. Okay, just get a standard USB cord, plug it in, turn your camera on. That's important. Turn your camera on and um, come to the import screen. And then you're going to either copy or copy as a DNG, which I'm not going to get into DNGs right now, but they're a good thing. Just know that. But you can start with just copy because you're going to copy what is on the camera memory card to your hard drive. Good question. Um, okay. Caroline asked, I used iPhoto before I started using Lightroom. How do I let Lightroom know about these thousands of other pictures? You know, that is a great question, Caroline. And I really, um, if somebody else knows that, I would love for them to, you know, provide that as an answer and I will read it aloud. I've never used iPhoto. I made sure to turn that option off so it doesn't try and import them. And I know that iPhoto can kind of hide the pictures from your hard drive. They're there. They're on your hard drive. But iPhoto kind of hides them. So I will investigate that if somebody else doesn't have the answer here. And um, maybe write a post about that. Laura, remind me. Okay. Caroline also asked, is one external hard drive sufficient for storing pictures? No. You should really always have your pictures in two places. Okay? So you need to have, if you have them on an external, you need a backup of the external. Does that make sense? Because hard drives can fail. They really can. And, or you could have the hard drive, external hard drive, but you can also make a backup to a cloud service. I used to use Garbon Carbonite until I changed, I had a new computer built, and then I didn't resync it. So before that, I had uh, copies of my pictures on an external, external of that, plus Carbonite. So Carbonite is a good option. Look into that. But you really want two copies, and honestly, I was at Photoshop World, and people were talking about like three and four copies. So it depends on how valuable those pictures are to you. Okay, Lisa Hall said, some images somehow show up on the image bar below, so the, the film strip. When I click on an image, it says it's gone. What's up? Great question, Lisa. So Lisa's saying that sometimes she, um, let me cancel out of this. Sometimes she sees pictures in here, but when she clicks on them, it says they're gone. What has happened is that you may have moved the folders. Okay, so if I open up, oops. Come on now. If I open up my Finder right now, or if you're on a PC, Windows Explorer, and I go to my pictures and I move them. So if I say, oh, I didn't want them there, I want them there. And I move them via my Mac Finder or Windows Explorer. Lightroom doesn't know I did that. Lightroom is not going to know what has gone on outside of Lightroom. So that is how pictures end up missing, is that you've moved them. And it, it happens accidentally. I've been using Lightroom for three years, four years, and something like that. And three years, I still do it occasionally where I will forget that I have some particular pictures like sample pictures or stock photos, whatever. I'll forget that I have them in Lightroom and I'll move like, oh, I don't like what I've done here. I'm going to move these over here. And then I go into Lightroom and I got these little question marks or they're kind of grayed out. That means it cannot find the file. The other thing is, if you have those pictures on an external hard drive and that hard drive is not plugged in, then it's not going to, it's like they know the pictures should be there, Lightroom does, but it cannot get to them right now. And that's what happens a lot for me when um, I don't have my external plugged up, which I have it plugged up right now, but um, is I'll have a lot of pictures with little question marks because saying, hey, you told us these pictures exist, but now we can't find them. As soon as I plug in my hard drive, all of a sudden those question marks will go away because now it can access that drive. So it's one of the two things. You've moved it or deleted it in Finder or Windows Explorer or you got them on an external hard drive um, and it's not plugged in. Okay. Um, so many good questions. 
Well, I'm going to get into collections in the, Cindy asked, how do you load photos into collections? I'm going to talk about collections in the intermediate. Collections versus photo folders. Great question, Amanda. Um, could you say why collections are more convenient than folders? Drop down. Again, well, can't get into it with beginners. Come to the intermediate or watch the intermediate um, video. I'll get more on that. Um, looks like several people. Oh, I'm sorry that my, it was web. It was go to webinar then. It wasn't me. I'm on like super high speed. Oh, I hate that. Looks like a lot of people for about two minutes. Um, I apologize. That wasn't me, but it was that happens sometimes at GoToWebinar. If their service is interrupted, it can happen. Um, we'll check the replay and see how it sounds. Okay. How do you see a before and after side by side? All right. Kara asked that. So how do we see a before and after side by side? So let's go to develop. And we need to be in the develop module to see that side by side. If you come down here to the bottom, all right, I've got a rectangle inside a rectangle. That's our loop. That's what you're seeing right now. And then when you see YY, I just click on it. Just click on the YY, and there we've got it. If you're not seeing this bar right here, go to View and click on Toolbar. So right now mine's hidden. See? There's no way um, whoops, for me to get back. I need to go back to whoops, View Show Toolbar. Okay? So now I can click back to one. If you want to change how it is, you just click on the little triangle. So that's how you see a side by side. Caroline asks, how many presets do you use per photo shoot, um, say for a family shoot example? If you're not trying to fix <laughs> contrasty problems from JPEG files, um, it, I use those clean edit or clean edit workflow um, ones, and I use several, like a little brightening, uh, contrast, sharpen, vignette. Um, I was shooting very low light, so sometimes I had to use a very high SO, so I'll use the noise preset. Um, I don't know, it just depends. <laughs> so I would say five or six. 10 um, of the presets and then the brushes, I use multiple brushes. I'll have like 20 pins. So let's go back to the brushes real quick. Um, so if you click a brush, we come in, we've got three pins. So the three pins, that's showing me where I started new brushes every time. So if I go to a different brush, say something like add darkness and I want to just darken um, up this area around her. See this? I'm just darken this up around her. I have a new pin. See the new pin right there? It's where I started it. And if you hover over it long enough, my mask is going to show up, and that's just showing me where I brushed. And if I start a whole new pin, say something like add clarity, because maybe I want to, you know, add some extra grit, which it's blurry so you can't see it, but if this was more defined, we could make the rest real gritty right there. Maybe make the stars stand out a little bit more in her shirt. So everywhere you see a pin. So a lot of times, especially for women, grown women, I'm going to have multiple brush pins. I'm going to have smooth skin, under eye circles, widened eyes, the pupil and iris ones like blue or brown eyes, um, whitening the teeth, um, sometimes color cast. Oh, let me show you that one real quick. So with this picture right here, it's a beautiful, hazy, I love the backlighting, it's great. But what if um, your client wants something not hazy, like they want more detail? Well, we can do that in the basic panel. We can bring these blacks back over. See that? So we're going to add, we're going to dehaze this picture with these blacks and um, just zoom in a little bit here. But what we get now is a little bit of yellow cast right under her chin, on her arm. See this right here? And we can do the um, colors. Fix yellows. There we go. Now, if it's not strong enough, what we can do is apply multiple pins. So I'm going to 
get this right here. She also has a little bit right here. And then I'll make it bigger. Get that. Now, I need to do a new one because I need more. I need to do it again for her right here. Even smaller. Okay. Still got a little problem right there, but it's better than it was. And we can see, so before, see the color under her chin and right there and on her arm. And after. So that is uh, the brushes that can help with color casts. And you get color casts, like sometimes you get green coming off of grass on the person's cheek and necks maybe. Um, if they're wearing a red shirt or next to a red wall, you'll have red casts on the side of their face or under their neck, things like that. Those brushes that fix those color casts can come in really handy and to balance out and get rid of those, those color casts. Okay. Is there a way to make the navigator image bigger? And um, honestly, no. I mean, not, I don't know. Honestly, I've never tried. <laughs> um, no, it's the standard. Okay. And the navigator in Photoshop and Photoshop Elements, you as you enlarge your picture, the navigator gets bigger. But that's not the way it is in Lightroom. So, no. I know what you're saying though. Um, all right. Emily, thanks for trying to help me with the navigator thing. Mine gets stuck sometimes, period. Like it'll even st get stuck on a whole different picture. It's strange. There will be webinars if you go back and watch. There, I've got one picture in the navigator that I'm working on in, in a different one. And it's this MacBook Air. I've never had trouble with that before. Um, would I, okay, Kristen asked, would you recommend for a beginner to use presets? Honestly, Kristen, yes, especially the workflow ones, because sometimes you may not know, if you're trying to edit quickly, especially if you're trying to edit quickly, um, you may not know how to reduce the noise or how to sharpen or what's enough sharpening or how to particularly do a certain thing and it'll take you a lot of time to to learn that and if you're trying to jump in and edit pictures for a client especially or whatever you may not have that time you will learn the more you use it the more you're going to learn i'm not i promise you will not become this dependent addict on presets if you start using presets as a beginner you won't you will learn what ha what presets can allow you to do is edit quickly and not have you get so frustrated with Lightroom because you can't figure out quickly how to do what you want to do. I've been there. I'm like, I'm just so mad. You know, I'm just going to quit and I'm going to use Elements or Photoshop. So it can allow you to quickly do what you need to do um, while you learn. And honestly, I am an advanced Lightroom user. I mean, advanced, and I still use presets because they give me what I want quickly. Uh, my butt gets tired of sitting in the chair. <laughs> so I want to get it and get done. How do you make a virtual copy? Okay, I could stay here all day long answering questions. I know Laura's probably saying, Amanda, you need to get off. Um, so let's say we're on this picture right here and we want to make a virtual copy. Let's just, you're in your film strip and you can right click, right click on the picture and do virtual copy. Now, you can also come up to photo and create virtual copy. Okay? And then you see there's a shortcut here. So, you can do the control and the little asterisk there or com command. So this is showing me on a Mac, okay? So if we're on a PC, it would be control and that. But on a Mac, it's command and that little thing. I don't ever do that. I just right-click and do create virtual copy, okay? You can do that. Good question. How do you install presets? Great question. Cindy asks, how do you install presets? So let's go over that quickly, and I'm going to take one more question. I wish I could take them all, but I actually have to let my voice rest before the intermediate. And maybe I'll take two more questions. We'll see. I'm having a good time. I love answering questions. Laura, we need a webinar where it's just questions, I think. All right. So how do you install presets? Well, you're going to, un you're going to download them as a zip file, okay? And they're going to be somewhere on your computer. Let's say you put them on your desktop. You need to extract them, and then let's 
say, let me do, um, okay, so here's the black and white advance, okay? So classic black and white. For the global presets, meaning the presets that go in the left panel, you're going to copy the folder. So after you've unzipped it, you're going to copy the folder. Command C or Control C, okay? Or you can right click and copy, okay? Then while you're in Lightroom, go into Lightroom. On a PC, you go to Edit and then down to Preferences. Edit Preferences on a PC. In, in, on a Mac, you're going to go to Lightroom. You're going to hover over the word Lightroom down to Preferences. Now we've got lots of tabs up here. You're going to click on Presets. Click on Presets. Then here in the middle, we have Location. And you're going to click on Show Lightroom Presets Folder. So then it opens up your Mac Finder or your Windows Explorer. Double click on the word Lightroom to open it up. Um, if, it, if you're seeing a different view, and then you're going to go to develop presets, okay, or double click to open it up, depending on the view. I've got these columns view here, um, or they're tiled ver vertically, so I didn't need to do that. But if you have them as icons individually, you're going to have to double click. And then don't go into user presets, don't. Just while I'm here, I would do command V as in Victor or control V as in Victor and to copy, okay. And there it would copy it over. Then I would restart my Lightroom. Okay, close out of all this, restart my Lightroom, and then the presets will be in this left hand side. Now, a common mistake, I just want to tell you right now, a common mistake is people will think that if they see it in there and they click on it, if nothing happens, that their presets didn't install correctly. And then we get a ticket saying, my preset did everything perfectly. It says it's there, but the, the presets are not showing up. I need a new copy or what's broke. I need a refund. I mean, it happens. <laughs> so I get, we get on and I, sure enough, I'm like, is there the little triangle beside it? Click it. And then you see the presets drop down. And it's a common mistake. I can understand new users, especially, you don't know what, how important that little triangle is, you know, you would think if it just clicked on it, it would open up, but it doesn't. You got to hit the little triangle and then the presets will show up. Okay. And a lot of fun, fun presets. So there's sweet mauve, um, soft mauve from the toning presets. Okay. One more. Oh, for brushes, you copy over the individuals. So you go into the folder and copy all the individuals. And those get copied into the local adjustment folder, not the develop folder, but the local adjustment. Okay, let's see. Okay, last question. Great question because it's very much part of the export process that I didn't have a chance to talk about. Shannon asked, if you add your watermark, do you have control over where it goes on your image? So let's do that right now. Let's do an export with watermark since I did not do that before. And I'm going to go to file, I mean, uh, file, export, and let's export this, this one. I noticed that the webinar thing jumped at me, so if there was a loss of volume just then, or sound, I apologize. I think web, Go webinars having problems here. So let's do this one, and now I'm going to add a watermark. Oh, this time I'm going to do, um, let's do like for, I'm going to do for web or something, you know. So this will either be a thousand wide or a thousand tall. It's not going to make it a square. It's going to choose the longest edge and which is going to be the, the width of it. And we'll do 72 for the web. And now I'm going to do screen. And now I'm going to add a watermark. So here I'm going to do the graphics lo logo. Okay. But I'm going to edit it. There we go. So there's the graphic. All right. Where are you showing up for me? I'm going to choose a new one, I guess. It's not letting me do it. Actually, I'm just not going to do a text. Okay. The graphic worked just the same. You just go in and find that file. It needs to be a PNG that's clear. Okay. And then you can move it just like this. So here we'll just do um, pretty presets. Okay. And 
I can change the font to something. You know, if you have a, if you have a font you bought, you can do it that way. Um, let's say I just want to do that one. And then I don't want a shadow. You can change the color and go on down. We can make it more opaque by reducing the opacity. Okay. We can make it fit the entire picture. We can make it go off, you know, but you don't really want that. Uh, we can make it proportional. So we can make it bigger, smaller. And now, see this anchor? We can make it be in the middle on one side. So let's say I want it on the left side, but I want to move it down. So now I can, oops, there we go. It's down the bottom. The middle wouldn't let me move it. So you do, you can move it a little bit, but you can't move it wherever you want. You can move it within the limitations they give you. So now I can say, um, I want to move this over a little bit more and I want to move it up. So now it's right there. Or if it's in the center, then I can move it down or up. Okay. Center is just center. It doesn't let you move. But these ex the exterior side, these outside ones, will let you move a little bit, okay, up and down. So that's how you can move it. And then you can save it. So that's how you saw I had um, EE graphic logo bottom left. So that's what it, was, it would do right there. So you can say pretty presets bottom left, pretty presets bottom right. Um, on my PC, I must have 30 different watermarks that I've saved. Okay, that's it. I'm going to have to rest. Y'all have been fantastic. I have loved all the questions. It breaks my heart not to be able to do more. I 